Smile. Welcome back to the Four Pod Men, the wrestling podcast we bring you each and every week on the Dynamo Podcast Network. Head over to YouTube, smash that subscribe and bell notification button. Audio versions show are available through Podbean, Spotify, iTunes, wherever you pick up audio versions of your show. And if you'd like to contact the show, we're on Facebook and Instagram, the Four Pod Men, and we're also on Twitter at T Podmen. Joining me tonight, the band is back together. Four men. How we doing, Jay? Oh, fuck yes, yeah, son. You are getting everything you paid for tonight, global audience. You are getting it all. The beef, the dog, the dynamo, and the shopkeeper. You better <laughs> believe it. <laughs> what else did I say? Joe, how we doing? Uh, great, and it's great to have the other two boys back as well. It's good to have a full crew again. Excellent. <laughs> That's not what you were saying on WhatsApp, but we won't get into that. Ian, how we doing? <laughs> I'm dynamite. I'm great. Good, good. Rocking that good game of Thrones shirt. Very nice. Very, very nice. <laughs> That's what it is. That's what life is. It's a game of Thrones. Awesome. A game awesome. of fucking whiskey, pal. <laughs> <laughs> well, tonight we'd, um, we said we'd, we'd embark on a nice show, continuing <laughs> our remembering series, where we look back at a falling hero of the game that we love and take a quick look at his career and what he meant to us. And tonight, on his anniversary, we're going to take a look at the one, the only, Jim, the Anvil Neidhart. <laughs> awesome. Jay, talk to me. Oh, God. I mean, you're talking about the, the heyday of Junior Roy's watching pro wrestling. You're talking about once a week when the television offers you something worth fucking paying attention to and staying in your heart for the rest of your life. You're talking about key men at key moments, at key points in time, and you will be remiss not to mention the excitement, the energy, and the raw just ah! of Jim the Anvil fucking knife heart. I mean, there's a reason I call him the hottest hot tag in the business because when I was a child and didn't understand anything about this sport, all I knew was these big pink, purple, and brown men were beating the shit out of each other. There were certain characters that just fucking, your eyes bulged out, you scooch closer to the telly when whatever he did or he had to do, he done, it, you just this. Boom went off in your mind, and you just there was nothing made sense. There was no reason. It was just awesome. And that man clearing fucking house to help us, pal. I know now it's wrestling psychology, but back then it was just fucking bliss. Absolutely. Joe, memories of the anvil. Uh geez, I, I, it's hard to follow Jay. <laughs> but now pretty much pretty much the same. Like that hot tag, just amazing you know and when i was and like, like jay when i was a kid and he used to come in and clean house it was it was you know you, the hair stand up on the back of your neck I'm like go on jim go on <laughs> so nobody wanted it more than jim either leaning over the ropes reaching halfway into the ring to get a fucking done when most men were just do, 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 do. jim wanted it like yeah no it just and I, there was there was one stage i know uh <laughs> Ian, Ian, Ian will tell you like at one stage I even looked like him. I grew my goatee out and I got a I grew my hair out a bit as well and I had it's I had a bit of you didn't do that when I had the long black hair yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I had, and I had the gut to match like and I actually looked scarily like him <laughs> but, uh, fucking heartburn foundation <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's Sam's chest hair, yeah. <laughs> the Bray Head Foundation. <laughs> no, a, lot, a lot of a lot of fun memories of Jim. I'm a big fan. Love Excellent, him. Ian. I suppose you know one of my fun. favorite. I'm going to give you one of my favorite ever quotes from Jim the Anvil Neidhart. And if you remember, it was at that uh, Canadian Stampede, with that mental show. Still, probably one of the best pay per views of all time. We're going to get hungry and we're going to forget our manners. Ah. <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's safe to say when we talk to wrestling fans and we talk about tag team wrestling, we always talk about the British Bulldogs and, of course, the Heart Foundation. So, uh, yeah, we said we'd get into this. So there's an argument. There's an argument to be made that, you know, along along with the rock and roll and the midnight. Uh, by the way, I know we said it on the Dynamo's Dozen, but once again, rest in peace, beautiful Bobby Eaton. Um, and I think it's apropos to say that, uh, you know. Apropos. The two, yeah, you like that one. It's a lovely word. I don't know what it means. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah, apropos. apropos. It's nice um, to say. It's, it's, but it is perfect timing because um, obviously – you know, Jim has passed. It's the year anniversary, and obviously recently we lost Bobby Eaton. Um, and I think um, when you look at 
you know, the rock and roll and then the Bulldogs and the Hearth Foundation, it could be technically the best set of matches you've ever seen in tag team wrestling, depending on who you speak to. I can only speak for myself and I would say that they are. You know what I mean? Um, so it's a great, uh, happy to be here for this conversation, especially with the, uh, especially with the old guard. Absolutely. Let's get into some housekeeping anyway. Born James Henry Neidhart, February 8, 1955, Montebello, California. Died August the 13th, 2018, age 63, Wesley Chapel, Florida, USA. Died from a head injury caused by a seizure resulting in a fall. Um, obviously, spouse was Elizabeth Hart, and of course, one of his one of his um, children, of course, is Natalia Natty Neidhart. Um, safe to say, this man he's he's from the old school way as well. He's wrestled in nearly every single territory and was also successful in every single territory. Um, just to run down on some of his honors, but of course, he has won gold everywhere he wrestled. Um, Canadian Wrestling Hall of Fame. He was inducted individually and with the Hart family. Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Feud of the Year 1997 with the Hart Foundation versus Stone Cold Steve Austin. We remember it well. Obviously, World Wrestling Federation, WWE Tag Team Champion two times with Bret Hart and was inducted into the Hall of Fame class of 2019. Just to name some of the honours. He's also in a number of other Hall of Fames. And he's also held gold in every promotion practically that he worked in. Um, he was a serious powerlifter as well in his youth. He was football youth. player as well. Yeah, football player as well, yeah, absolutely. Um, so 1978 to 85, he worked in Stampede, of course, New Japan, Mid South, Georgia, and Florida. Um, so you can see this is a man who broke in well in the territories and stuff like that through that period. Um, who were territories as well? Absolutely. Mm, uh, 85 yeah. to 91, we have the Hart Foundation. They made their pay-per-view debut, of course, at WrestleMania 2. In the uh, blue and black, by the way. Blue and black, absolutely. Night Ian, Hart Foundation. That's it. Ian, Hart Foundation, give me some thoughts, some memories. Oh, no. Well, yeah, Jay, Jay, Jay spoke too soon there. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> yeah, look, you dug your own grave there. <laughs> no. Jay does like to uh, wind me up and say the Neidhart Foundation, but to be fair, it was built around that. And I think I think Jay made a great point before um, on a previous show, like that. The other fella, as Jay likes to call him, Brett, was was obviously so good at getting the shit kicked out of him and the sympathy and stuff. And you could see, as you say, Amber biting at the bit, almost biting the fucking turnbuckle, like George the Animal Steel waiting to get in. And that's the great, like, that's the psychology Jay was talking about. You know, obviously, Brett was such a, a good seller at the time and gaining sympathy from the crowd. Took a tremendous beating. Yeah, took an amazing beating. You know, it's actually the likes of him and Michaels and obviously, uh, oh, Ricky from the rock and roll as well. You know what I mean? These, these, these boys, you know, were it's just a different level. I think the three of those, especially yeah. in tag team wrestling, the three of them, um, Ricky Morton, um, obviously Shawn Michaels and Brett um, were, were just so ahead of their time in terms of just getting the sympathy. And I mean, I, I suppose it's different with the likes of uh, with the other two tag teams, with the Rock and Roll Express and the Rockers, because they were both kind of similar size, you know what I mean? Whereas the Hart Foundation had this big juggernaut who would fucking launch himself over the top rope. For a a very agile attack. juggernaut. And I know Joe loves that as well. Like anytime Joe think, thinks of that, I just see his eyes lighting up with that launch, that missile over the top rope. But the timing that uh, Brett and Jim had, it was absolutely impeccable. I think it's up there with, with any tag team that you can you, you can throw at us. Um, and just when you think of their matches against absolutely anybody, whether it be the Killer Bees, whether it be the British Bulldogs, it's probably their best matches. Um, it didn't. It really didn't matter who they who they wrestled because their their teamwork and obviously their friendship that they had in real life as well. Um, I I think didn't Brett say something that like they actually never had an argument. You know what I mean? Yeah, Somebody's you can team. see that. You can yeah. see that in their chemistry. You can you've yeah. touched on a point there that is very important in, in the respect to tag team wrestling. A lot mm. of tag team wrestlers come in and, and, and everybody wants the hot shot. And if they're two men stuck together, they don't realize that the, 
the symbiosis of two becoming one and the team being greater than the sum of the individual parts is the pure essence of tag team. You're in there as one unit, not two men, not one planning to break out five years down the pike. And the reason that the Hart Foundation were able to maintain main event status, regardless of the boss's view on them as a draw, is simply because when the audience watches two men who are clearly there's a the, the, the chemistry there which is intertwined way past the camera when the camera's off you know that them two men have each other's back that yeah. transcends script medium and match and the reason they were able to maintain every time they stood in this at the side of a ring together regardless of which one it was and regardless how close to the, their final run together yeah. there was a massive span of time there and we wanted to watch because we wanted to watch them the heart foundation were a team and a lot of tag teams don't fucking get that it's yeah. important to work as a unit, not as two hot shotters looking to make your next break. You've got the time and the place at one, like you've got one, where you are is where you should be working, not looking to your own future past it. And it's the reason so many tag teams broke up or don't have the laudits that these men had. I mean, the problem with the fucking anvil is what people tend to see is these this big bruiser who came in and smashed fucking house. He wasn't. He was something a little bit more than that. The man was a near 270 or 280 pound, whatever weight he was. Fucking athlete. He was an agile man younger, with physicality. Yeah. 300 pounder he was a freak mm-hmm. and even way past that he had a chemistry mm-hmm. like his, his, his personality was just i've interrupted go on <laughs> no you're actually right jay i'm glad you did you, you to be honest with you you you, you kind of spoke a lot of sense there and, and and probably conveyed it better than i could have i think um one thing we forget about jim is that uh, he was the promo guy too you know what i mean um, and I think he really was, you know, and Brett will always tell you that he was like, I had to wear shades. Like people think Brett wore shades because he wanted to look cool like Bono. The funny thing about it is it was actually because he was nervous as hell. You know what I mean? And he, he, he had never really done promos, whereas Jim just seemed to be, you know, whatever. Never forget the talc, I suppose, in the 80s. But, uh, you know, <laughs> he was worried on a different plane. He was worried to the same radio channel that fucking Hawk was. He every was worried word. to the same radio channel that Hogan and Macho and Warrior were too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, oh, yeah. Definitely, they were definitely playing. one of them doesn't think it's he, he thinks it's real. It is real to him, god damn it. It is, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he Jim would have been sitting there listening to Warrior promos going, I get it. Yeah, all, all, get all, it. All, all lines lead to promo awesomeness. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. He knows. He knows. I've been telling you, Brett. I've been telling you, Brett. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I think even when they started out as heels, when they'd wear like the all black with the bits of red, and then the the blue and uh, the, you know the light blue and black, and Jimmy Hart as the as the um, as the mouthpiece for the outside, it was just uh, it was perfect, and I think. You know, we go back and look at things. This is how big, um, you know, the Hart Foundation got to. Like, they, they kind of surpassed the tag teams, like, you know, at that time, like the Killer Bees and, and whatnot. And they actually, those Bulldog uh, Hart Foundation matches actually start headlining the B shows. You know what I mean? So, like, they'd be running the three shows a night. Like, and obviously Hogan was in New York or wherever, and some they, they could be there in Texas or Chicago, Philly, some of those big wrestling towns, and they'd be they'd be headlining them. And that's what um I remember, you know, Jim and Brett doing a shoot a while back, and they're saying, look, a lot of these matches, you can't even really find full tape of them, and they were mm. they were actually better than the pay per view ones, you know. Yeah, so absolutely. there was a chemistry there that was just I don't yeah. think you'll ever see again. And of course, Joe, they made that pink look so cool, didn't they? Oh, oh, absolutely, Jesus! It was, it, um, <clears throat> it was, it was almost. I'd say if I was a little bit older, I might have actually started wearing pink. It's two <laughs> lads that you wouldn't, two lads that you wouldn't go up and slag for wearing pink as well. No, true, very true. Like you know, but that, when you when you guys, um, especially you, Ian, were talking about chemistry, like, you know, surely Jim has to be in the conversation for one of the for greatest tag team wrestler. You know, because he was phenomenal with Brett. He was brilliant with Owen. Uh, he was lost by himself, unfortunately. Um, but he was just unbelievable in a, in a tag team. And as, and as Jay alluded to earlier, you know, a, a tag team, you, you become greater than the sum of your parts. And he really did when he was in a tag team. He was, he was at home in tag team wrestling and he was absolutely magnificent to watch. Absolutely. And can we just add as well, like... Jay mentioned earlier about, you know, two guys wanting to be the next big thing. 
but by all accounts, Jim was actually, you know, his his own tag team partner's biggest supporter when he did go and go single. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's it's very rare, isn't it? You know, Jim Jim had no kind of illusions of grandeur or thinking he never about, once came across as bitter. No, never, never once. Never. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure he must have viewed it as being a huge part of Brett's success. Mm. So um, I'm sure that, that was very satisfying for him, you know. Yeah, to my memory, lads, correct me now, as you know how terrible my memory is. <laughs> he always walked out behind Brett, I think, and Owen. Yeah. You know, so he never, as far as I can remember, when they'd walk out to the ring, he was always at the back. That's because uh, if he walked out at the front, Joe, you wouldn't have seen the other two boys. You wouldn't have seen Brett. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? Do you remember that? Uh, do you remember their best? Edge? Also, when you know it, you don't have to hot shot. When you know your shit don't stink, you don't have to hot shot. You can walk where the fuck you want, and you're still getting that job done. A little, uh, a little one that I remember them talking about. I think it was in Brett's book actually saying that when when they were doing that, Vince was loving their, you know, loving their teamwork and loving the the matches they were having, and you know, loved having Jimmy Hart and all there. But when when uh, you know when Wardrobe basically said like Brett, I think said, look, we need a, a different color, and they brought the pink and black. And when it, Vince saw them, it just went, That's there it. it is. That's it. And do you remember the the best entrance? I believe it was the demolition match, wasn't it? Where they wore the, the pink Jim Neidhart had the pink hat, the yeah. pink fucking <laughs> yeah. it was like 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 one of those catering hats. Yeah, like, like the <laughs> Russian hats, like we're doing the little <laughs> um like that nice, was nice in the domination or something. Yeah, like that, yeah, 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 yeah. It was like it was like he needs a soapbox here now. He's about to tell us something. Yeah. That we need. It was he almost was, that uh, uh, feeling off from that. Like, I mean, he didn't give a fuck to the point where he was just walking out with his pals to have a wrestling match anyway, and there just happened to be forty or fifty thousand people and a TV fucking camera in his face. But he was going to do it anyway, even if they were like there. New Day, isn't it? Like the way New Day just yeah. went like, "Well, look, very natural." Yeah, they've yeah. got nothing for us, so let's let's fuck about. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Living the dream, baby. <laughs> but those ring jackets, I have to say, like when you when you look at the two of them, because I mean, when I was a uh, Jesus, 1990, I'd have been like seven. I remember like calling him Nightheart. I thought his name was Nightheart. <laughs> like, <at> Night. <laughs> yeah, I'm you're sure. Not the, you're not the only one, Ian. Yeah. Only and one. I was like, shit. Yeah. I was like, Nightheart. I was like, why? They had the same name, I suppose, blah, blah, blah. But I remember my dad, believe it or not, you know, w- without starting an argument here, Jay. Sorry, I come in peace. Um, obviously, I was a, I was a Hulkamaniac. <laughs> you know I mean? That's not the um, way it goes. <laughs> but I remember my dad was like, he fucking, because him and my uncle Brian, that's that's where I got my wrestling from, to be fair. And my, my grandmother, of all people, but she was more of the world of sport um, kind of side of uh, wrestling. But I remember my dad going, ah, my favourite is Bret Hart. And my uncle Brian loved Jim Neidhart. And they used to just love watching them. And I think that's where it came. And I was like, eh, I suppose maybe Bret Hart will be my favourite too. So, yeah, my love of Bret Hart comes from my dad. So you can blame him, everybody. It was, look, it was a great improvement, even if it, through my eyes, it was a slight improvement globally. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great improvement. You know what I mean? <laughs> Get that man a whiskey. Get that man a whiskey. <laughs> but no, it's, I mean, the, their entrances were great. And I mean, even the music was phenomenal. And like the Bulldogs, look, their entrance was, was shite. Um, the ring gear was shite. Yes, it um, was. Even though, Thank even you. though it was, even though Thank it was kind of nice. French. <laughs> even though it was kind of nice. I'll give you. I'll give you as a funny one, right? It's a fucking second. Union Jack, nice. <laughs> give, no, I mean the design was nice, but the colors were horrible. Uh, <laughs> I always liked the dog. I'm I'll give you. That. I'll give you a funny one here, right? This is a. Yeah. This is a true story, and I've told Joe this before. Um. I remember years ago, I used to obviously the Hasbro rings and the Hasbro figures had the Davy Boy figure, the Hasbro one, and he used to do that. Yeah, for some reason he was the same shape as the warrior. I was like, why? <laughs> but um it was a great figure. And I remember it was at Christmas, and I remember all the tinsel hanging down. I was like, Oh, I'm gonna call this pay-per-view something to do with Christmas anyway. And I had them coming out of the, the tinsel. And I was sitting there playing with it one day, and it was Brett versus, uh, it was actually the Hart Foundation versus the Bulldogs, but it didn't have a dynamite Hasbro. So uh, my dad turns around, I'm sitting there, you know, I used to hum the music, and I'm sure there's plenty of kids that used to do that. You know what I mean? Hum the music. And you go, yeah, like, right now. <laughs> yeah. 
But I remember humming. Dun, 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 and my dad turns around and goes, what the fuck are you singing? Like, You're what? evicted. Like, British Bulldog's coming out and he goes, yeah, well, don't hum that ever again. <laughs> Safe to say that's the day I knew that, that fucking music was bad. We're all right. <laughs> You're all right. Oh, Jay and my dad would be sitting there going, you're all right, Mick. <laughs> and from that day forward, Davy Boy I never did it to again. Come out black and dance. <laughs> this is the first. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like the girls don't invite me. Like, come on. That's that's your that's your music now, Dave. Sorry. <laughs> where, where the fuck is Flanders? Putting the take in politics. Where the fuck is Flanders? What medals are you talking about? Oh, Flanders, what? Okay. Oh, shot no, 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 I'm not even going there. Well, welcome to the Week in History podcast. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's get on. 90, 91, to, <laughs> yeah. 91 to 92, of course, the new foundation, of course, went on. We touched on it. We did an episode. Not the so beautiful gear. Long. Can we just say the check? <laughs> Lovely gear. That was not going to not be said. <laughs> there was, yeah. There's another bit of gear that Jim didn't give a flying fuck. <laughs> He went all out with the chest and the belly on that one. He didn't give out. Are you not taking your gym gear off, Jim? Fuck you, I'm going to the bar like this. Nice you, want me to sh- you want me to shave, Vince? Ask my bollocks. I'll shave my armpits for you. That's about it. He went through his whole career without ever admitting that he was colorblind. I can't see shit. I'm a ginger, Vince. Fuck. <laughs> Oh, that burn chest there. <laughs> <laughs> 92 to 95 goes back out kind of on the independent scene, but also goes to WCW. Um, can we, met- can we, Noel, just, just on that one, can we actually talk about, because you always hear Bruce Pritchard talk about that, um, something to wrestle with. And I'm not the biggest fan of Bruce Pritchard, but uh, he does great impressions when, he, and especially when he talks about it, that Vince, Always got the call from Stu because Jim would be left behind somewhere, and he'd be like, "Yeah, hey, uh, Vince, uh, you know, <laughs> little Rhino's wife is on to me again. Uh, no, they've got a lot of bills. Can you can you fit them in there somewhere?" <laughs> and in fairness to Vince, like he used to always bring him in at the behest of Stu asking him for the favor, because obviously the respect there was just. You know, astronomical, I'm sure. So far past the, 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 so any other respect he's ever had for any other human. For anybody. all a spade of spades. Oh, for anybody. I think Stu Hart is probably the only man that, you know, Vince would just go, all right, fuck it, I'll drop whatever you need. You know what I mean? And what it would have been done about, what, five, six times, Ian? It wasn't oh, once. It would have been, definitely. It was definitely. on the wreck. <laughs> I know, like, it was literally about five or six times that he was back, 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 back. And obviously... You know the hearts were obviously close, and they they got a they got a spot from. But yeah, no, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you on that yeah, because no, I know no, where no. you were going. But obviously, I just thought that's a funny story. Yeah, you get a spot for the old rhino. Uh, <laughs> you know the wife was uh, calling me, and they get a lot of bills. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, debuted in WCW on May the fifteenth. Obviously, tagging with the junkyard dog, and um, went and did a couple of tours in New really? Japan, wrestling Tom Zink, no less. And also did some touring in Australia as well, where he worked programs with Jake the Snake Roberts. Then went on to the indie scene for a little while, where he worked Brutus Beefcake, Ron Simmons, Marty Janetti, just to name but a few. 94. Jesus, that's a lot of beef for him and Ron Simmons in the same ring. Holy scary, shit. Isn't it? Scary. Imagine <laughs> those shoulder tackles. <laughs> Imagine those barbells. <laughs> Imagine even the, the meals as well. <laughs> we need five plates of beef. Can you drink what you lift? No, but I'll give it a try. <laughs> Absolutely. Returns to, returns to WWE 94 to 97, has a reunion with Owen, of course. Um, and also worked this character, who, if you remember, the one with the mask. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Roger Daltrey wants his gimmick back. <laughs> does anyone else think that was a Jerry Lawler inspired thing so he could tell shitty jokes? Don't comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, that was a punchline. Yeah, I think that's all it was. I don't think it had anything to do with McMahon. I think it was Lawler just wanted to take the piss out of someone, and it was that was an easy option. Yeah. I think. Book Lawler. 
Then, of course, we get the Heart Foundation reunion and then the departure, of course, in 1997, of course, on the back of the Montreal screw job. Back now. Um, returns to WCW in 1998, tagging with Bulldog, and then goes on then to wrestle in Memphis, semi retirement 99 to 2016. A semi retirement, semi retirement <laughs> over nearly over what 16, 17 years. Wrestles with heroes of wrestling, Memphis Championship Wrestling, and of course, Border City Wrestling. Um, comes back to make a number of WWE appearances 2007, 13, and 18. Was the 15th anniversary battle royal in 1997, and of course makes a bundle of cameo appearances on the reality show Total Divas. Um, of course, when we talk about Jim, of course, he had a number of run ins with the law, and also he had his demons, not unlike a lot of workers in the business. Um, but he completed two stints in rehab funded by WWE as well to get him back on track, stuff like that. Um, I don't know. It's 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 hard to know where we start with him, you know, and, and and where we end with him, you know, because he was such a big part of our lives in terms of tag team wrestling. Um, yeah, I, I think a good starting point with him would be how, what would he have been if he had been clean, mm. you know? Can you know, imagine? I just say something on that as well about Jim. You 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 kind of mentioned look, because one of one of his most important, um, I think runs was that that the Heart Foundation with the whole DX and. Stone Cold thing, like if anyone recalls that epic return that he had, um, like Jim Neidhart was kind of forgotten about in 1997. And if you remember, Brett was doing the whole wheelchair gimmick with the bum leg, and you know he was at the <laughs> Stone Cold was about to fuck him off the side of the the Titan Tron, if anyone recalls. And that's when Jim Neidhart came out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the start of the retur- of the build up of the Heart Foundation because this was when Brett was being a heel, and Jim came out and fucked him over and started baiting, baiting him with the crutch, and that was when you slowly saw the build then of the Heart Foundation and Brett being the little manipulator going, oh Owen and Davy are fighting here, so hmm. and he comes down and goes, what are you fighting for? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then starting to build a group. I mean, I yeah, have to say. Guy. In my opinion, that was the best year in in WWF uh, television history. I think, I think yeah, Stone Cold has even went as far as to say that uh, that's his favorite thing to watch back. He was saying like even Brett of all people was the best promo guy in 1997. Well, when you talk about a turnaround program, uh, uh, that's probably an episode on that as well. You know, one yes. set, like run yes. of a program, but one character building a family or a, year. or a stable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's got to be top five ever. The the, the whole the resurgence of, 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 of the heart gang, for want of a better phrase, yeah. because it was it was but past the foundation when they started including the likes of Pillman and stuff like that. It was it was oh. just wonderful to watch it. It was a resurgence, yeah. it was a, a turning point to other things that were already happening in the company that married into each other perfectly. It was stable v stable, but there wasn't a stable to game with. We got to see the grassroots and the bake, the build, the build, the build, and the payoff. And it doesn't happen that often in pro wrestling where it's something that is it's even if you don't like these men involved, you're enthralled by the whole program to see the payoff. And I mean, that's rare calico. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I do. I think that's the best for me personally. Anyway, I think that for WWE, I think that's their best year in history. That 97 year. And it was I a think it was, point. It was the prelim to, to get the company to, to what it became. It, it, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? That the guy that, you know, got, got fucked out. Was kind of the guy that fucking helped put put those foundations in, no pun intended, um, and you know they all fucked off, and you're thinking Jesus Christ, because when you look back at that year, I, I actually encourage anyone to go back and watch it, even uh, if you want to just go from 1997, um, you know maybe start from from the around the time Brett and Steve Austin start uh, feuding, just watch that whole year of pay per view and Raw like week by week, take you a while to do it, but. Good Lord, the payoff. If, if, if we had wrestling like that nowadays, Jesus. Well. well, you would almost draw, you can almost draw parallels in right now. We'll talk about leaning on uh, former angles in times of strife. The, 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 the fucking, the Reigns Uso family type of thing has almost that feel, but from the exactly. flip side of the coin. Like, exactly. It's a very, you know, very good point. Yeah. And Pritchard yeah. was there for that. And he's yeah, right. It's, so, yeah. Nothing's, new, in the, nothing's new between the ropes and we're seeing it work again, which is... Yeah. 
yeah. testament to the success of how it was done previously. It's yeah, and it's funny how Reigns is gonna. That's that actually. I I didn't think of that. The parallels with Reigns and Brett's character there is actually quite similar too. The kind of the cool personified, but yet still the manipulator there behind it all, just orchestrating, pulling the strings. It's a very good. Um, it's obviously a Pritchard thing. There we go. Absolutely. And of course, the feud with Austin was voted feud of the year in 1997 anyway, so that's the kind of level oh, that it was at. Come on, of course. Joe, any, any final thoughts on the anvil? Um, As I said, I, I, I just loved him. I was always excited to see him, especially as Jay said, when he'd be champing at the bit in the corner, just <laughs> stretching out. To, and then when, when he'd get that tag and just come in and start, just like a whirlwind, come in and bait the piss out of everything that moved. Um. <laughs> Just and, and like when I go back and watch stuff, like he, he he's just he, uh, just an absolute joy to watch. Yeah. And it's a pity, it's a pity he got lost in the singles. Like he just disappeared. Just I don't I don't know whether it was that he didn't know that no one knew what to do with him or he didn't know what to do with himself. But he seemed to be lost and he was on his own. Uh, but phenomenal, phenomenal tactic. Yeah. yeah, it's not really his fault. He was lost on his own, Joe. The mix was too big before him already. He never got to lay any foundations for himself who's just again it's the same with fucking animal it's the same with a lot of these men who were lifers they uh, holding little white ropes it's not that they were useless on their own it's just that they were half of what they were and you can't who is, is expected to succeed when the sum of the parts to make two one was infinitely better than being thrown into a mix on your own and only being half of what you were to begin with you, you can't succeed like the, the deck is stacked against you because you've got all these men who are career singles wrestlers and you've been working in a completely different spectrum of pro wrestling. Like they're yeah. not the same thing. And anybody who thinks they are, the, the fact that somebody like Jim would be expected to survive on his own is a testament to how good he was in his particular field of pro wrestling. You know, it's it's not fair to compare the two. It isn't. And it's not fair to expect a man like Animal or Jim or even fucking Rick Steiner to 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 excel when what they wore was half of something so much fucking bigger, like. Well, you, you, you kind of see, I think Davey Boy is probably one of the only ones. Um, well, that's down the cornrows, clearly. Yeah, yeah. But like, you know, because we knew Dynamite was obviously great as a singles wrestler, but I think Davey is one of the ones that excelled in and had a career as a singles wrestler on top of that. I, I'm talking about WWE now, of course, because, yeah. you know, we can go down, you know, the, the, the Southern Territories is a different story. They could all do it, but... Um, I think Davey's one of the only ones in WWE that actually kind of went and made his own path. Um, was that not, um, sorry to cut across you there, yeah. was that not uh, like a, uh, more so for WWE to cement the European market? Oh, I'd say so. Game? I'd say so. Because Dynamite I, I, obviously I, fucked. I, so, yeah, yeah. I, I think if they... If it was that definitely wasn't, a considered and ground push. Yeah. I mean, the fact that his yeah. biggest blow-off in the history of his career was against his brother-in-law, a man who was obliged to care for him, his family, and a professional that's fucking rare again as well like and then let's not disrespect to Davey he was always a joy to watch in the ring I like even that blue jean badass Davey when he was running with the gang and he didn't have cornrows even then I was like yeah you know what he's still good he's still a pro wrestler I mean now they I, were I wasn't I wasn't trying to shit on him Jay I'm just I don't no, think he was yeah all right I don't I don't think he would have got that push no, you're that. right the, yeah. they, they were mad to cement that European UK market you're 100% yeah. correct Joe you're 100% correct yeah, I think so. It's 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 like um, you know, it's no different than kind of. It's like when you looked at when you look at that match, for example, that you're talking about in, in '92 at Wembley. Like, of course you're, you're gonna, gonna be pissed. Yeah. Of course you're gonna have the fucking hometown boy fucking you know win, but geez, there was only one man coming out of that. You know, <sighs> I was supposed to go to the next level. Do you know what I mean? When you look at uh, kind of all of the. Uh, the variables and stuff like that, but and, and Davy didn't really last much longer. Davy was Davy in, in that respect. Like Joe's hundred percent correct. He was definitely groomed by the company to yeah. to, to market. Joe's right, yeah. To, uh, to 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 England and Europe in particular, even the European belts. <laughs> but <laughs> you, you can see certain men have limits. They have a stop. They have they have like a spectrum of talent which will take them to a point. It's almost like a bus route. It'll get you to stop seven. Whereas other men who are pushed over the fucking moon, they're pushed over the moon because they've surpassed the levels on the route. 
they can go further and further and start breaking. Well, I think I think you're right, Jay. And if you look at it, like if you think about it, and this fits for for the anvil as well, kind of to go what Jay was talking about, or sorry, what Joe was talking about. Um, you you put anyone in there with someone like Bret Hart at that time, they're gonna look like a million dollars. The problem <coughs> is, it's it's you know what I mean. The problem is then, right, when you're bringing them into the next match, then how does does the Mountie have the capability? to make Davey look that good. No, because A, he's a dickhead, fuck you. And B, he doesn't have the skills. You know what I mean? So does Davey, I mean, I think Davey had great skills and, and I'd, I'd agree with you is what you said. He was a, a good wrestler, yeah. um, but, yeah. I, but he wasn't. He was card all day long. Yeah, but he wasn't of, like, even though he could kind of do the flashy kind of stuff that the likes of Dynamite could do and Breck could do, he couldn't control the match that they could do. Do you know what I mean? That's the difference. They were He wasn't a general. The, the, that's the difference. There's a yeah. general in there calling the shots, going, bro, I'm going to take care of you here. I'm going to make sure this works, blah, blah, blah. Davey, unfortunately, I don't think had that capability. Or probably at that time, you know, mentally probably wasn't uh, capable of doing it. But it, it. It doesn't matter anyway when we specify in single out. And Jim guys. is the same. Sorry, that's what I meant with Jim. Yeah. Jim could be carried to something great. But I think Jim's, as you said, Jay, Jim's biggest asset was hot tagging. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. I've seen I've seen Jim Neidhart wrestle in, um, in Stampede, you know, in one-on-one matches with Bad News Allen and stuff like that. And, <laughs> it's just sloppy fucking you know rah, let's bait the bollocks out of each other kind of stuff but mm. he wasn't um, he wouldn't have been what someone like Vince would be looking for well there's, there's the science world. behind that as well he's a, he's a big man with a fucking high octane level he, he, it's the quarter mile in a fucking drag a drag car as opposed to a fucking Le Mans 24 hour race you physically yeah. speaking there's certain men who have aspects to their career and pro wrestling when we analyze pro wrestlers as individuals we're doing them a great injustice in the sense that pro wrestling as a show, as a concept, as a five card set up for three hours of entertainment value is not individuals. It's a jigsaw and the jigsaw to create the full picture. It needs all of the pieces in place. A man like the Anvil Neuhart has his place in the jigsaw. I mean, there's certain freaks out there who can go 40 minutes for anybody and still be the size of a fucking bus. But you'll find that their career is very short simply because they were a slighter sized man who put on a lot of mass and were working off the stamina of a smaller man whilst carrying a lot of ornamental muscle. Jim Neuhart was a big fucking boy from the get go. He was never going to be a 45 minute fucking main event superstar, but you don't want him to be that because you've got a card of five matches of that guy. You don't have a wrestling card, you've got the same match five times. There's yeah. many different aspects to pro wrestling and to, to strip down and analyze a guy individually on his own outside of context is a disrespect to, to the art and what it's supposed to be, which is a full presentation performance. Every aspect catered for. You need your foil flyers, you need your lightweights, you need your tag, you need your ladies. And I mean, it's, when we talk about these men, they're great because they were great at what they were great at. Not because they were great at, they weren't, at what they weren't able to do. Because not everybody can do everything. And when you learn to do it, you can do it at a high pace for a short amount of time. But then your body says, you weren't built for this, pal. Yeah. You know? I'd, like to, I'd like to close off my personal opinions on it and then pass it over to the host because I'm dying to see what the host has to say about it because I, <laughs> yes. I know he's a big Anvil fan. So, um, you know, Noel always kind of assumes that I'm the, the heart guy and that's fair enough. But, um, yeah, I mean... That it's not just was, Noel that thinks that. No, it's not. I think four men are in agreement on the same page here tonight. I think, I think, all, I think, I I think, think all, all of our listeners are as well. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think all of our listeners are in agreement too. Yeah. Um, but no, we're, we're, we're being respectful. I think, um, yeah, I mean, that, 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 one, that one did hit me a lot when, when he passed as well. You know, even though, because it was something like 63 is not, it's, it's still too young. Um, that that one did kind of fucking you know hit hit pretty hard, especially when you look at that picture. I think Jay, you sent me that picture around the time, the black and white one where they're all standing there, the Hart boys and Brett. It's all in black and white, and Brett's the in the pink, and he's the only one left. It's kind of shit. Like God, this is this is horrible. You know what I mean? Yeah, bless him. He was very lost for an awful long time. I was yeah. only watching a little ten minute at Big Net on YouTube, and they were talking about how when he was getting his fucking trials on the gridiron for the fucking Raiders and stuff like that, that even then he had amphetamine troubles. 
a testament to the man and not any disrespect to him. Every man is born with his problems and deals with his issues differently. To maintain yeah. the level of personality, charisma and energy that he did for as long with his demons sitting on his shoulder for as long as it did, that's ridiculous and remarkable at the same time. Other men lasted no time with half the fucking problems he did and no disrespect to the man. Like I said, we all carry our shit. And, and so I thought I thought that. Brett and Natty done the best fucking tribute that they could. And you know what? That, nice. little, that little rasta fucker that tried to take down a you know a 60-year-old man, fucking cancer survivor, and try and do that what he done. You know, a testament to fucking Brett for getting up and continuing on the show and saying, Hey, I guess some guys can't handle it. That shows that's a level of professionalism that I don't think can be touched. Old school. Old school, yeah. You know, and uh, that guy got a nice fucking hiding too, <laughs> and rightly so. <laughs> but uh, Noel, I'm going to hand it over to you for the final thoughts. Yeah, I suppose in summing him up, like, I mean, he was he was such a big part of my life in terms of Heart Foundation when I looked at WWF back in the day and stuff like that. But I always, you know, when you go back and you look now and the little things we touched on, like the ring gear, and like he was up for anything and also how he walked out behind those guys as well. He was such a guy. He was so much of a giver and less of a taker. And he was also cared so much for the people that was beside him more than himself, which was a true testament to the man as well. And as you alluded there with Brett being, the, you know, kind of the last survivor, really, it's a testament to Brett as well that he carries everything that went on in his own life but he also carries the legacy of all these other guys as well that he still carries around to this day being the sole survivor, if you like, you know? So I suppose, I mean, that's where we should end really. Um, yeah. I mean, this has been our remembering. Before you made me cry, motherfucker. Episode, <laughs> looking back at Jim, the Anvil Neidhart, one of the true greats of tag team wrestling and an absolute stellar human being in terms of who he worked with and worked against. Gentlemen, till next time. This has been the Four Podmen, Dynamo Podcast Network on YouTube, Spotify, Podbean, iTunes, wherever you pick up audio version show, you'll find us there. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. How was Jim the Anvil Neidhart in your fandom? What did you think of the Hart Foundation and his career? Till next time. Cheers, man. <laughs>